Hello and welcome to another episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. As always, this episode of Lateral Think is brought to you with the support of Strength by Numbers. Strength by Numbers have created an integrated clinical and sports performance system. The AXIT system uses force platforms, dynamometry and strain gauges to objectively measure everything from isolated movements um, to sports performance tasks. The system has greatly enhanced our clinical practice, decision making and objectivity. We are no longer guessing. The greatest thing is its ease of use both for practitioners and clients. There are no wires, no fixed setup. It is a fully integrated Bluetooth system. If this sounds like something that would enhance your practice, visit strengthbynumbers.com and tell them that Melbourne Athletic Development sent you. So today we have my brother on, Thomas Williams, and we're interested to get you on, Thomas, because you are a musician and you are a teacher. And I think there's a good opportunity to have a conversation to think about or talk about education and learning and pedagogy, and also about your own experiences as a classical pianist, of looking at the development of classical musicians and thinking about how that may vary from other musicians. Mm-hmm. So do you want to give an introduction about yourself? Sure. So I'm Thomas Williams. I started playing the piano when I was eight years old. Uh, I remember Why did you wait so long? I actually would have started much earlier. Is that why you didn't make it as a classic pianist? <laughs> that is exactly why I'm here. <laughs> I'm not on the world as stage. a teacher. <laughs> um, I, I remember I begged mum and dad for a piano from Santa Claus when I was five. Hmm. And I, disclaimer, that was, no, it must have been six because I remember I found a keyboard in like a cupboard somewhere that Santa Claus gave me that keyboard like three weeks later. What are you suggesting? I'm just saying <laughs> Santa Claus had just left the present in mum and dad's cupboard. And um, that came with some instructional video. So I was just like, apparently play that video till it broke. And then I had my first lesson with Bessie, the first teacher when I was eight. No one in the country where, country town where we're from, they wouldn't start anyone until you were eight. For what, I don't know why. Which goes against a lot of the typical... Um, pedagogy about absolutely how you teach totally yeah anyway they had that mentality I started when I was eight I did my first lesson and apparently the teacher said to mum you need to buy this boy a piano and mum was like no nah, he's gonna get over it <laughs> he's like such a skittish child and after the second lesson she's like like I insist get him a piano so I remember I don't do you remember the first piano we had it was like a very big old heavy piano it was mm. about two hundred bucks. And yeah, I just kept playing from there. And then when I was about 11, I played cello for a term because we had a teacher just down the street, but then she left town. So I only did for a term. And then I joined the local brass band. And every time I go back, I still go and check on them. That's the one that dad's playing with a bit. Uh, And then I, so I did a bachelor of music at Melbourne Uni. I was accepted at the National Academy of Music in, at the end of 2011, which uh, is basically like the AIS for classical music. So it's here in Melbourne. You go there and you do a uh, performance program where they just put you in loads of concerts for the whole year. So you, they throw you in the deep end and you do a lot of what's called chamber music. So you play with other people. And uh, I was there for two years and I completed a master's of performance at the same time. And then I went to Germany for a few years because I wanted to try work as what's called a repetitor. So that's a pianist who plays for the rehearsals in an opera house. And I've always worked with singers and I love, I've always enjoyed playing music with other people as opposed to solo. Uh, And so I went to Germany and I did that for a few years and I came back and did my Masters of Teaching, which has put me where I am now as the head of music at Richmond High School. Very good. Mm. I think, like, for some people, it might be confusing why we've got you on, but I think the key thing is actually the nice combination that you have about being the person who's gone through developing a very high-end skill and now going through this process of having to teach it Mm -hmm. and also the uniqueness that exists in something like classical music when you compare that to other types of music, say, like jazz. Mm -hmm. I think we'll get into those kind of differences in hopefully some depth, but one of the first things that I think we thought we'd ask you is, you know, classical music tends to be something that you learn by repetition. Mm -hmm. It seems to be almost rote learning. Is it that simple? Is it that the people who are very good at rote learning become very good classical musicians? (laughs) Uh, When I read this question, it made me question that myself. But I, so rather than think of classical musicians, how does any musician anywhere begin? 
And I think that, uh, so one of the trainings I did when I was younger, I learned how to become a Suzuki piano teacher. Suzuki was a teacher in Japan who lived for 100 years and he developed this system of teaching very young children music. And he thought of it as language acquisition. So he said, don't bother to teach these kids how to read music. Like they can't, they're not reading at that time Japanese. But you can teach three and four year olds to acquire music. And so his approach was play the kid loads of recordings of what they're going to learn because this is like when they're learning to speak, they're hearing the same conversations all the time. And eventually they learn how to interpret those conversations and use them. And, you know, a little two-year-old kid is not talking in sentences like we are. They're using limited vocab, but they're able to communicate. And I think that if you think of any musician, irrespective of the style, that is initially how I think of music. It's like, what are the little skills or language things you're giving them to develop? Does that also require, though, from my understanding of Suzuki, that the parent also has to have a certain amount of knowledge and skill set too? Absolutely. Yeah? So this is, for the Suzuki thing to work, mm. the parent has to work with that child a lot, like, every day. Mm. And are you saying in the sense that they need to be immersing them in that absolutely sort of music so all the time? The good Suzuki parent... Is, is the tiger mum. Is absolutely the tiger mum who is playing the CD of that child's repertoire in the car at home. They're actively listening, they're passively listening, so that when the child then goes to the violin or the piano, they sit down and they go, oh my God, I know this. Mm. It, how do you think, now as a teacher, how do you think that that differs from learning other skills? Do you think that it's a similar thing? Because to me, that's almost, you're trying to get them to acquire it via osmosis, right? It, it, it's, it's being imprinted onto their brain. Mm. And that makes me think of two things. Of One, is that possible for all types of skill acquisition or learning? And two, is it only unique to that very you know, that, that area of brain plasticity that we have when we're younger to acquire things like language. I'm not sure, but I, I read a book recently called Stolen Focus. And he, and it was either this book or another book around education myths that have... Uh, and I was looking at, um, like, should we teach kids facts or should we teach them skills, knowledge versus skills? And it made me think of how I learned the times tables. And I distinctly remember learning the times tables by having this CD by some guy off play school and I would just sing along. Mm. And I don't think I really understood at the age of seven that six times eight equals 48. But I just remember in this song, like learning it and just repeating it over and over and over. And eventually the it clicked and going, oh my God, this means that you have eight lots of something mm. resulting in that. You just made the association of six, eight, 48 basically. Totally. And it was just it? like, I could just rattle it off. Mm. Or like mum said when I was about two or three, she would read me this same Wind in the Willows book every day. And one day she was reading it to me that she said, I actually stopped and I read it back to her. And I wasn't actually reading. Yeah, I had just had memorized. totally mimicked it. So I think that musicians, again, of any style, this is a good way to start. If you are modeled something well and you replicate that. So if my first teacher was Igor, who was my teacher at undergrad, I think if I was mimicking Eagles playing as a six-year-old child, that would be a phenomenal because mm. that's like such a good base to be, to kind well, of grow. Here's the question: Is mimic mimicry actually understanding? Probably not initially. For well, if, even even when it's very well defined, do you think it actually represents a very strong understanding of it? I I, I guess. With, if we deal with like small children, how much do I want them to understand and how much... Uh, I don't know at what points we make certain things more and more conscious. Mm. Um, and if you're dealing with small children with music, I want them more or less to be able to play back. Until then, I might give them a piece of music they don't know. They might apply some of something from piece A into piece B and, and realise, oh my God, that's why we... We do this. I imagine the other element too is the technical component to it as well. For sure. About mastering and the ability to play certain classical pieces, you, like you need to have a certain skill set. I imagine that if you have just taught yourself and therefore picked up bad habits, it's actually going to limit your ability to play some of the great Absolutely. pieces. Absolutely. So, you know, in wanting to have someone like Igor mm. model you uh, as a beginner, mm. you're also modeling like exceptional technique. I guess mm. it's like 
I imagine if you were training young kids running, you want them to model very good runners or people who have exceptional technique in the way they're doing it. Interestingly, I think that with that, it's very difficult to do that because they don't have the physical capacities to be able to represent those things. Okay. And I don't know if it's similar in music of you may not actually have the ability to carry out those technical skills because mm. of whether it's your size, you know, I guess with piano it's probably, you, you know, your limb length and your finger length sure. and all that kind of stuff. Is that the same? What I try and mimic is the sound always. So if you play like Mary Had a Little Lamb, and you just do like bum 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 bum, and you're playing like very notey, as opposed to playing like. I'll try and get the child to play it in the second way once they can have once they've got the notes there. So we try learn the notes, make it melodical. Then make it melodic and make it a be- like take care with the sound. It's interesting you say that because I think that that opens up that more rhythmical and even creativity side of being able to manipulate what you're doing does that take a bit of a jump on their end to be able to see that those two things are related and they can be manipulated i think um if you're talking in terms of creativity with music i think that the you're probably addressing two various types of creativity being creative with a score that already exists and being creative with a score that doesn't exist, like improvisation. So if we take, how do you be creative with a score that exists? Ideally, what you have to do is sit the kid down, talk about all of the options that we have with these notes. Like in a chess game, you've got various options, but you've still got a a very strict structure within that. But within that, you can be quite creative. Mm. So, And you can talk about why you are creative or why can the melody start soft and then get loud or why can it start loud and you can get soft or whatever it might be um or where does the melody breathe well, well, you go well i was going to say the, the thing that stands out to me whenever i've seen you perform or say when we saw Igor and olga perform a couple of months ago is you obviously have the technical ability to perform the piece but the thing that i think you're very good and passionate about and obviously someone like Igor and Olga are too is they understand the context of how that why that piece is written so they actually know about the composer they know about like the era that they lived in and they understand like I know with Igor and Olga they talk a lot about with that piece the piece, one of the pieces they did of the story in which that piece was written because mm. I think it was a, for an do, opera do, or something like that. Do you think that's that. important? Or do you well this is where I think it's interesting because like you know is this is something that I always often think and I know you probably what well, you think about this too tom of you can see a brilliant 15 year old kid mm. play a masterpiece but there's actually no heart in it and sure. it sounds a bit weird to think because it's like well aren't you just playing the peat like the notes but there's obviously a bit more to it than that look does it matter that you need to know the context of a piece in order to inform your interpretation mm. probably mm. for a young child is that important i'm not sure mm. can they, can they can you get the same level of performance out of say a brilliant young musician who really doesn't understand much about that piece mm. but they're technically I think very very should. strong say, rather than the piece what do they understand musically yes what do they understand about how a melody should be directed what do they understand about the harmony underneath that melody that's pushing and, and, if, and if they're strong in that can they then produce a performance absolutely yeah. absolutely that so it makes up for that say lack of heart that jack mentioned yeah so you of course you get these like young kids who are technically brilliant and they're also, they probably look expressive because their teacher has taught them, like, do this at the end or whatever, you know, um, phrase off at the end or take a moment here. But at what point can that child then take an unknown piece of music and apply it themselves? Um, well, here's the question I have for you because I think trying to tie this together to where some of our listeners would understand is the idea of developing, say, skill sets in your mind for, say, a younger musician. Are you getting them to practice that skill over and over by, as I said, doing Mary Had mm. a Little Lamb over and over, or are you getting them to sample across different types of music that are in the same level of kind of play but gives them the opportunity to explore different technical skills? Because one of the things that we've talked a lot about is this idea of sampling mm-hmm. across like and not specialising too quickly into a certain whether for you would be a type of music yep. um, and for us it would be talking about you know a sport or a skill 
um, or a movement pattern and whether that in the long term becomes limiting because you've actually like narrowed their focus too quickly. I think initially with kids, basically all my beginner piano students that I've ever had, they all have to do Bartok Microcosmos book one and Suzuki book one. So I limit the repertoire that they get. But how, how much is in those books? Uh, so in Microcosm, the first book, there's like 37 short pieces. And in the Suzuki book, I think there's something like 20 or something. Okay. But how much do you encourage them to play other instruments? Or do they, do they play other instruments? Uh, I, don't, I don't actively encourage it, but if they... Why, why is that? Uh, is, it, is it a negative? Is there like a... It's definitely... Like, I think it, it helps. I think if... Because it's not common, is it, in, particularly in classical... I actually think it's quite common. Oh, really? Most yeah. classical musicians you will meet will be able to play a second instrument to a certain, not at the same level. So, like myself, I play trombone. Mm. My trombone playing is not as good as my piano playing, but I can also pick up the trumpet and make do on that. I can now pick up a guitar and make do on that. I can make do on the bass. Yep. I think musicians absolutely should play more than one instrument. Well, actually, that's something I've. I've be interested to ask you anything I ever had, but I think it was someone like Ray Chen, yeah. right, who's you know, world renowned violinist, and I know that he also played piano and he got yeah. his Elmas when he was twelve or something. I think it was Amos years, but like yeah. exceptional, something ridiculous. Yeah, is that actually common then for even the world renowned um, mu- classical musicians that they often played multiple instruments? I don't look. I know a lot of them do. Mm. Um, as I said, not really at the same level. No, it, and that but I think a lot of them do have that where they they might not even play, but they'll be able to transfer that skill very easily. And I think that's probably something that we're interested in because if you look at typically very good athletes, mm-hmm. particularly more, um, you even see like it's more common probably in America. But they, like you've had the greats who played multiple sports, even like Michael Jordan totally. playing baseball. Yeah, they didn't play very well. But no, it's actually it's funny because if you actually look at some of the information about it, he yeah. actually was quite good. Mm. The reason that he didn't go on was during that period that he went to baseball, there was a baseball uh, lockout. Oh, right. So he ended up not actually getting the opportunity to play very much, hmm. and that's why he was like, screw this, I'm going back. Oh, okay. But the talk was that if he actually had have had the opportunity to stay and play in the major leagues, he would have progressed enough mm. to get to that level pretty quickly. Well, and I would have thought, though, too, like someone like him is the exception, but for a lot of elite athletes in whatever sport... They're often very good and have sampled multiple sports. They might not necessarily achieve greatness in another sport. You know, look at but the they're very athletic. Like Roger Federer is obviously a good example yeah. of that, where he was played a lot of sports. So in when I was at Anam, I was there 2012 and 2013. In the second year I was there, uh, a really famous music pedagogue came and worked with us, a guy called Richie Gill, and we formed a choir. And now, when I think about this now, like none of us were singers. But every musician, if they're a decent musician, should be able to come and join into a choir. So for, in a classical context, that should mean like we three are all classical musicians. You sing a bass part, you sing a baritone part, I'll sing a tenor part, let's go. They, I think a good musician should be able to do that. And that's a combination of like good oral training. But it, like that Anam choir we did, we were phenomenal. And we sight read this stuff. If you don't mind saying so. If I didn't yeah, say yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> but like that was, and I remember talking with Richard afterwards. I was very close. He was like a real mentor for me. Um, and I remember talking to him and he's like, this choir is actually, this could be a phenomenal choir if they wanted to be. And mm-hmm. I think that was more a level of the musicianship that we were at. Would you, if you, is it possible to get a 12 year old who's never had any experience playing the piano to become world class by the time they're, 2025. I, I think this would, I'd love to know what Igor would say about this. I think they could. But I think you'll get teachers out there that go, if you haven't started by six, forget it because you're not going to get certain motor skills. I don't this believe is, that. This is, you know, this is the Anders Ericsson kind of. The 10,000 hours one? Yeah, well, mm, yeah. he never actually said 10,000 hours, but it's this, it's this concept of you need to have a certain amount of what he considered deliberate practice, mm-hmm. which the definition of deliberate practice is important. It's actually practice where you're very highly being in a very constructive way, critical of what you're doing and sure. you're learning from everything. And very you're doing. consciously yeah. doing this. Yes, yeah. yes. It's like, and the big difference that they found, they did in, I believe it was in Berlin that they actually did this study. Um, and I think it was on violinists. It, I think it was viola players specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And what they found was that the, the ones that separated themselves, even within this high-level music school, were the ones that 
really deliberately tried to work on the areas that they were weak mm. and consciously were trying to upskill themselves um, and seeking out help in the areas that they needed improvement. I constantly say this to students, like particularly at the school where I'm at, but also my piano students. I'm like, there is a difference because every most students will say, yeah, I practice every week. And I say, tell me what that looks like. Mm. And I'll, they'll tell me and I'll go, okay, so how much of your, like, let's just say playing at home equals practice, which it doesn't, but <laughs> let's just say. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because there is a difference between sitting at home and playing the piano and sitting at home and practicing what your teacher has given you. Both need to happen. You need to sit down, and I just need to sit down and just play through stuff, because I love playing so this stuff. So you're talking like structured versus unstructured learning? In that Somewhat, case. but it, but like some kids would just want to sit down and play through the songs they know, mm. but they're not playing on what they're working with their teacher. And the teacher is like Pushing trying to... Pushing them towards exactly. skills that if they I need think to develop. There's yeah. a student, there's two students at Richmond at the moment um, that play guitar. Mm. Very good. But they, these two like to play certain repertoire and they're, they're good at that. And I know that the teacher was encouraging them to play like what's called finger picking style on the guitar, which really pushed their, like their technique because beforehand they're just strumming. I know that as opposed to, <laughs> as opposed My to guitar skills. Yeah. And like, I know that these students, I think they're initially a bit reticent, like most students to do this because it's difficult yeah. and it's hard and you can't do it straight away. So I'll just play this Metallica song. I know. Well, it's just that it's that innate, human behavior if we don't actually like going out of our comfort zone for sure i even noticed that myself with cause i've been trying to play piano a piano guitar as you know but doing something that you're not good at doing or you just have complete no concept of it's actually very very difficult yeah. psychologically that is so like if now if i look back i think i've probably done ten thousand hours at the piano mm. but if you consider that you've done ten thousand hours what was the effectiveness of the first 1,000 versus the last 1,000? Like, I couldn't even compare them. Mm. You know, it's that if I if they were all like that last 1,000, and I'm sure this is for anyone who's acquiring any skill. Wow. Like, you refine the way you practice. Mm. And I become much more efficient now. Mm. And I know, like, Eagle also keeps, he still practices. It's actually, uh, that's a question I wanted to ask you then, John, because I think it's relevant is, what about from a, a sprinting p perspective? Because I know you've talked about probably the importance of getting younger athletes, but when do you think they actually you know, they need to have input from a coach to develop certain biomechanical abilities? Well, they talk about like the skill hungry years and I think it's a bit different to say like the language development, but it's usually around the times of those peak mm. high velocities. Um, you, you, it's, it's also interesting too in running because- You tend to have two. Well, you learn to run, like everyone learns to run Innately Not anyway. well. <laughs> yeah. No, but you're obviously coming with the ability of like, show me your ability to run and you do it and you might look and go, well, that looks terrible, but... Yeah, they talk about the skill hungry years and I think it varies obviously male to female, um, but typically you're going to have that first growth spurt is between sort of eight and 11. And so that's probably the first time where you can have really big influence. Mm. And then they go a bit awkward and gangly between the next period. And then it's usually from sort of 13 to 15, 14 to 16, um, boys maybe to 17, where they have that next big jump in that skill development. Is it right then in thinking, so for you guys with athletes, if you've got like a mum who goes, my kid, like he's five years old and loves to run, which is like, great, just go and do little athletics, go do everything. Well, the great thing about little athletics is that early on, particularly in those younger years, and it usually fits in that sort of six to 10 range, they actually develop a lot of broad motor skills mm -hmm. and they teach them all the events, which if you get exposed to that, it actually is a really good foundation. Mm. Now, I wouldn't say in any way it's very strict directed learning. It's very much more just sampling different movement patterns. Mm -hmm. But even that seems to have quite a significant effect. The thing that made, like, made me think about what you, when you mentioned that and what you've been speaking about is how interesting the interplay becomes when the student, and I wanted to ask you, Tom, because when the student, and for me, it's an athlete, when you go from letting them do the skill, as you said, like just playing, yeah. to this is practice, and I'm going to pick up on every little thing that you're mm. doing, and it's not that you're necessarily hounding them every single time they do something, mm. but you're de redirecting them back to it, and you're like, okay, well, how did you think that went? It becomes really uncomfortable for them really quickly. Mm. And even, you know, like Jack, you mentioned... I probably need to go with younger athletes because I have older athletes who I think their movement patterns are somewhat set and that creates real issues because I try and change some of these things. And it's not that they can't do it, 
it's actually that often they're so uncomfortable about the fact that I'm like, okay, that was wrong. You need to have a look at this. But what about if we try that? Let's look at the video. They don't, actually haven't gotten used to that process of being very deliberate in what they're doing in terms of technical mm. development. Mm. And there's also, which is probably a little bit different to what happens with music, but they need to actually have the physical um, capabilities to do so. So if you're not powerful enough, you can't push across the track in a mm. certain way. I even think of it just from the tissue capacity development too because you're going to be laying down so much important connected tissue networks and chains that if you're getting a 20-year-old athlete, you've kind of lost that period of five, however many years it's going to be to actually change that. Exactly. And I think, yeah, the the thing that I, I, I struggle with, as I said, isn't that is hard to change and sometimes it takes you a few years before you actually see that flip over. And the problem then you have too is, are they willing to go along that process of having up and down performances and inconsistencies? Exactly. And, ability to and I th- as perform? I said, I think one of the things that tends to happen is that you end up in this position where they're so uncomfortable about this process mm. that it becomes almost a psychological management that you've got to deal with, with a young person who's trying to navigate their confidence around what you're trying to do. I think it's like with, if I think of this with music, my undergrad years mm. certainly like because you're dealing with someone between the age of like eighteen to maybe yeah. twenty three, and they're uncomfortable as a person at that point. Absolutely, they're developing and they've got some sense of self, but they're you know they're unsure and of themselves. I remember at that time being frustrated with the university system I was in because I knew I had flaws in my technique because there's things I wanted to do that I just couldn't. However, every twelve weeks in a semester, you've got to perform whether you're ready or not mm. so it's like well how do we manage to try and to have some growth and development in your technique but also satisfy the performance requirements that are required of you and now looking back on that do you think that's a good thing or bad thing that you have these sort of clear dates to actually test yourself look i think it was probably a good thing mm. the thing i struggled or just didn't accept was i probably should have picked repertoire that was easier that i could have more refinement with yes mm. But that wasn't the repertoire that I loved. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to play all this. It's always the case, though. People who are typically high achievers and see themselves as being at a certain level want to try and mm. achieve even a higher level and again. It, I guess in terms of, like, injury, like, I'm lucky I never really had any injuries. But I remember some people in my course certainly did. They, they were, like, pushing and pushing themselves. And, in fact, one singer I know, um, Ashlyn, like lost her voice and not in the course but later on and had to totally relearn how to sing Mm. and it's like yeah you want to did you see any correlation between the people who did get injured and those who didn't you know there's any certain traits with how they were there personality elements physical elements certainly personality because there's they might be just getting like too obsessively practicing. I think physically they probably weren't very like fit people either. That seems to be a big thing I see with a lot of musicians. Absolutely, <laughs> they're so dedicated and sit down for hours and then practicing, but they actually don't do any physical no. activity. And like I remember that particularly at Anam, we had we had some young kids at Anam as well yeah. who were just phenomenal, but like wouldn't make a sandwich for lunch, you know? <laughs> like um, they so. You know, certainly I think some of that would probably help you as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that, as, as I was mentioning, do you think that there is that disconnect that exists between the psychology of deliberate practice and getting better? Um, because I think that that is the biggest hurdle. Like, once you accept this is not going to be a fun process, yeah. hmm. right, all of a sudden you accelerate your improvement. I think by university you accept that. You have to. Okay, here's the question. How do you deal with that now as someone who teaches adolescents? Do you you actually talk to them about this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it? Absolutely. So, like, in the context I teach at at Richmond High, I'm teaching a whole class. Yeah. So in the junior years, um, year seven, we do with just singing and percussion. So we, I don't really have to worry about that. They're just like, sing along with us, be involved with music making, enjoy this experience. And then by year eight, we teach them like a set skill of playing the guitar. And I, it took me until this year to realise one of the things I have to teach the year eights at Richmond High is that you're going to do this same thing over and over and over and over and over again because the students there will go, oh, I've played this song through once, I know it. And it's like, well, okay, great. 
you have to now do it another 10 times and try and do it without any mistakes. Mm. I think and that is just that, that's going to, I think some people call it grit. Mm. You know, that is a real skill yeah, the, the that duck, musicians have stuff, to yeah. know. Yeah. Angela Duckworth, like work. I don't know if you, have you read grit? No, but I've, I've heard about it. So it, no, it's interesting you say that because I think that's one of the things that I recognize very early on. And I've had to actually like, and I explain this even to some of my guys a couple of years ago, obviously, people will know that I had had a basic go from, you know, running this time to this time really mm-hmm. quickly. And in terms of the performance, you know, a lot of people kept saying to us, well, you know, her execution's really good. She keeps executing the race model really nicely. Mm-hmm. Like, how are you doing that? And I said to a lot of people, and I think she said the same thing, of like, in a very boring manner, we do the same things over and yeah. over and over and over again because we want to nail it when we get to the performance in competition. And that, that I think, for some people is a bit trippy with how much concentration you need to have in a physical, ex- like an ex- physical exertion like running. I think also, too, is the development may not always be a linear process either. And that's well, not at all. Because she, she, she obviously made quite a large improvement. You know, I if we translate that to a music performance, I find it difficult, and I've come to accept this, of where you rehearse the musicianship and the expression into your piece so that when I get in front of the audience, that's how you would do it. Mm. And I think that I think both schools exist of where pianist A, who is brilliant, has rehearsed this Chopin ballad exactly like this, and they get in front of the audience and they play it exactly like that. I was going to say, if you, when you think about the best performances you've ever had, what do you think were the things that led to that? So, for me, I've had to <laughs> embrace becoming a bit more like performer A, because it's not. I don't feel like that's my natural thing. What I do you like, mean? I've had to really consciously look at, like, okay, so in each phrase. What points am I lingering on? What am I pulling away from? And it seems like there's a lack of spontaneity in that. But it's, I think what having to perform like this has made me do is justify musically and I guess technically why I'm making the decisions I'm making as opposed to getting on stage and feeling nervous and feeling young and full of fire and I'm just going to go for it and let it go. Mm. Well, you but that forget those, about everything in the process. Yeah, but I think those in the past, those kind of performances that have been good there's probably been more error prone as well. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really care at that point, but now I've, no, it's interesting you say that because the more you talk to, and you know, and as I've been able to sort of spend time with more high level coaches, the thing they always talk about is consistency and averages. So Mm -hmm. they're like, don't tell me what your personal best is. Tell Mm -hmm. me what your 10, your 10 run average is for this season. Mm -hmm. Which it's the same with what you're saying. It's like, I don't want to see your best ever performance. I want to see your ability to perform this 10 times at this level. And as you said, it becomes that thing of needing it to be really high, even if it's not the best performance you could possibly do. But it's very close, but you can do that every single time. We had a violin teacher at Anam. In fact, one of the brilliant things about the time when I was at Anam, and Anam is still fantastic, but we, we had a lot of conferences around practice because actually during – it wasn't until I was at Anam that we really consciously talked about the way we practice. And I, that's one of the things I try and bring to students now of like, you need to know how to practice. What, Gen- kind, what kind of things? Because I think there is a lot of crossover that you see with – say sports training that I think potentially there's things we can steal from you. So what, what kind of things do you talk so about about how you set if up? If I take like a, a, like a piano lesson with a half hour piano lesson with a small child and it's like you go through the book, you've done your scales, we look at some known repertoire, we look at some unknown repertoire, you need to do this, this, this in your, during the week and I would just leave it there. What I now do with my students is I say, I need you to practice in front of me. I want to watch what you do for three minutes pretend I'm not here and play these four bars and make them better in front of me. Hmm. That has been one of the most valuable things I have what, ever What do you observe? What happens? Um, some, some kids will just play through it and play through it and play through it and keep playing the same mistake. And I don't say anything. Hmm. And then after that, we'll go, how did it go? What did you notice? Okay. And then try and bring them to a level of awareness of something. Or if they made the mistake and then they corrected it, 
You go, that was wonderful. So what do we do from here? Mm. So teaching kids how to practice on, for music is like, it wasn't until we were at Anam and we had one violin teacher who said, if when you are practicing, you are practicing at like 95% accuracy of the score because you're, you're playing it too fast, so you can get 95% of it, but you can't get 100%. If you're only practicing at 95% in performance, that is the best you can hope for. Mm. But we all know in performance, you get nervous and da-da-da-da. It down, it's yeah. probably going to be 80%. And that's, that's that saying of, you know, like you don't, you know, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall to the level of your training. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's very true. Like if you are consistently practicing at that level, that's what, as you said, and it probably will go down, not up. Yeah. Um, there's the rare the re, the rare beast does find a way of enhancing the performance sure. from arousal, but it's un, it's not common. Um, I was going to ask a question then too. When you look at good teachers, do you think that the teachers that produce the best musicians are the ones who are monitoring everything that they do and picking them up on everything that they do, or the ones that develop those skills to be able to become much more autonomous in their in regulating Probably. their practice? <laughs> It depends on where the development of where the student's at. So probably early on, you want to be like modelling perfectly to that child how to play, mm. expecting that perfect modelling back. Maybe like, do you know the um, what's the the taxonomy Bloom's taxonomy? Yeah, you know, it's like initially, I can't remember what the first one is, but yeah, it's like know. just mimicry and just remembering. Mm. So for the young like, like for young kids, I would teach piano. So it's like I need you to just play this back to me so that if mum closed her eyes, she can't tell if it's you playing or if it's me playing. That's what I want for young kids. And then as we get further and further up, you've got to, I've got to pull away and let them make mistakes but question why are you making these mistakes. So they're making it much more like, have much more metacognition around it. Because does someone like Igor get input from other people? I but probably from his wife because yeah. she's also a pianist. Yeah, yeah. Um, when he and he plays, a, he used to play a lot of chamber music. So chamber music's when you're playing with someone else. Um, that gives you input. Mm. So whether it's a matter of interpreting this Brahms violin sonata that we are doing together, or um, playing with an orchestra, mm. um, but he, I think. There's it, it, something also to be said for like I want to go and have a lesson with Igor. I almost don't care what he says. I just want to go and have to sit down and play in front of him because it's going to put me in a certain frame of mind. Well, but does that create a level of pressure that means that your performance is more open to criticism anyway? Absolutely, for sure. So, and I even find that now, one of the things I tell students is record yourself. Mm. So, um, like even just you've played a piece, we are going to record it and create performance conditions. Mm. Because one of the other things with the 10,000 hours with music is that, yeah, 10,000 hours in a practice room is one thing. 10,000 hours on on a stage or in a stadium running a race, that's a totally different yeah. thing. Well, context is everything, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you, you do need these, those high-pressure environments to yeah. be able to sort of practice that. I, the thing that... Well, I want to finish this part about talking about this development before we get on to, I think, the more interesting topic, which is, you know, improvisation and more creative pursuits mm -hmm. um, or creating your own music. Um, with all of this, do you try and, you know, you mentioned the student getting to that point where you've set up the environment, you've seen them practice. Are you consistently trying to create opportunities? I've been really getting very enamoured, even with, you know, these people are in their 20s and some in their 30s, of trying to create opportunities where they have wins, mm -hmm. right? Where they walk away and they say, I actually did learn something today or I got something out of this practice or this mm -hmm. session. Is that something that you're conscious of, particularly with younger people um, or even people across the board that you work with? At school, we have a, a thing, that we use a thing called HITS, like High Impact Teaching Strategies. And I used to really... Um, push against it very so much i used to push against it a lot because i just said oh god it's just some like new new age thing and i must say like i've eaten i'm eating a bit of humble pie oh really because i think some of them i think oh, i could do without but having like like a learning intention in a class yeah is um, very important totally and a success criteria now yeah. i hate the word a success criteria because i actually think a fail criteria will teach you much more like you it's interesting that isn't it what, what like explain why 
Um, I think that, so it, let's just say it's a lesson and you had, every group is going to perform. And a success criteria might be like, we got through our piece um, and um, with minimal mistakes. Do you, do you set both? I actually haven't, but I, I think... Well, because I think that that's an important... Like, I think you say this is the parameter we're trying to achieve, yeah. so that's success. But it's funny because you touch on that. And I think that one of the things that I think is a real issue is... And it's not necessarily to consider it a failure, but like a level of responsibility that you need to take for your actions or your, mm-hmm. your in this case, performance. Same with, you know, my guys on the track. I think one of the things that even some of my athletes find funny, and I'm sure your students do, is holding them accountable to their actions, mm. right? Because in most areas of life, people don't set a failure criteria. Mm. And a silly one for you, for instance, might be they turn up and they don't have their instrument, <laughs> right? That's an instant fail. Yeah. You're like, go home. I don't want to deal with you. Or yeah. go to the principal. Or whatever you do, yeah, right? Yeah. And... Some students would think, oh, Mr. Williams is just going to let me sit in the corner and play on my phone, right? And some teachers may allow that kind mm. of behavior. But if you said that that's a fail criteria where you just say, you don't have your instrument, leave, right? And you're getting detention or whatever it is. Very quickly, they learn, okay, I'm responsible for mm. actually turning up prepared. And a simple part of success is actually having my instrument available to me. Look, being back at school on site for the whole year... I realized when you set for like in music, I think the most powerful thing we can do in a, in a classroom music situation is set performance parameters and make the kids all play for each other because mm. they're all nervous and they're all going to, some will like want to make a joke out of it, but most of them don't. Yeah. And the other, so whether they perform for each other or they've composed something online, like in this thing we use online and we all sit and listen to it actively. And actually, they, for the most they part, really engage they totally engage. Yeah. And they are interested to watch each other and see each other uh, succeed. Or, and that's so nice. Yeah. Well, I think that that's... Uh, dealing with younger people, I think one of the interesting things is they, you know, and this is a, a, a general observation, but they play off as if they don't care about things sure. and everything's a joke, as you said. But they genuinely do care about their own progression and the progression of the people around yeah. them. And they want to get better at things and they want to see people do well. So I think, as you said, creating opportunities for them to actually engage with that, whether it's online or whether I, it's, it's you know, performing for each other, is really important. Yeah. And creating that environment seems to be really, really valuable. And I think particularly high schoolers, um, primary school, this is easy. Like, you see this much more easily. Where primary kids want to do right by adults. Yeah. I think it's the same for high schoolers. Hmm. And particularly if they're doing a subject that they love and they have respect for you as a teacher, like they, they want to really do right by you. Mm-hmm. And even if they're not going to continue on to do music, they, they generally are like, you know, oh, I, got, I played the G chord at the right spot each time. I was like, yes, you did. That was really good. Yeah. Um, I've got a question for you. I think this is transition to our next, next topic. I, I, I obviously live together, so I get to see you practicing a lot. You're obviously a very accomplished classical musician. <laughs> And where is this going back? <laughs> yeah, and I and it's interesting because it's a theme that I've seen not just with you, but some of your friends who are also classical musicians. Yet, whenever you try to perform jazz performance, jazz piano, I see a lot of frustration and difficulty come up. <laughs> Why is that the case for me? Um, because well, and actually, but say we probably need to define, define what the difference what's is. the difference between jazz and classical. So, classical music would be, in a generic sense, Western art music that the the musician learns from musical notation. So, for musicians, this is having a staff with the save with the five lines, a treble and a bass clef, and the notes on them. And you, yeah, you learn. Lost me. Well, the, so <laughs> the composition. Didn't you do the music at school, John? The <laughs> composition is not recorder. original. You're playing the. Yeah, so I'm work playing. Someone has written. I'm playing like like you have to learn. It's a the cover. Lines of Romeo from Romeo and Juliet. You're going to read the lines that Shakespeare has written. We'll preface this by saying, as that I failed recorder in primary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you needed a better teacher um, or a better instrument. Um, so I'm learning pieces that have already been composed. So classical musicians, as you're, you're doing general, covers, basically. We're doing covers. <laughs> and we are doing that using the stylistic elements that we know. So, like, I know that when I play a Mozart piece, there are 
performance traditions that go with playing Mozart, as opposed to playing Rachmaninoff, as opposed to playing Bartok. A question so, on that, because I've always thought about this. Okay. Do people put their slant on that? And absolutely. How, how is that received? So, <laughs> so you absolutely people put their slant on that. And you just, you get uh, performers who are famous for certain things. So if I think of Mozart, if someone says, who should I listen to? I say, go listen to Mitsuko Uchida, this Japanese pianist who just plays Mozart so beautifully and just with so much fun but, and joy. But, and but is it done in a way that very is very respectful to that piece? Totally, in the, it's in respect is, to the style, yes. Is there almost disagreement or... You know, people not do people not enjoy almost like what they would say is like playing it in a way that is not so. If you listen to, to how it was potentially composed, yeah. So if you listen, to, we can talk about Bach. Hmm. Bach didn't have a piano in his lifetime, so technically speaking, you could say Bach never wrote a piece for the piano. However, all of the keyboard works that currently exist for Bach, now we accept that we're basically going to play them on the piano. Now, in Bach's day, you had a harpsichord, which is like a precursor to a piano. Mm. And you know on a piano, you've got like the, the keyboard, and underneath you've got three pedals. Harpsichord doesn't have this. So even now, you have pianists who say, if you're going to play Bach on a piano, you have to keep the same limitations that you have on a harpsichord. So you can't use the pedal. They, these people are in the minority, but like... So is, that, is, is that sort of considered like traditional and being overly in, conservative? In a way. Yeah. So like there's this guy, Andres Schiff, and his playing of Bach is exquisite. But he literally will never use the pedal. Okay. But what does the pedal do? Uh, so the pedal that they're talking about is a sustained pedal. So if I hold the very right hand side pedal down on the piano... It's like I, the accelerator. It hold the accelerator <laughs> down, and then you play a note, and you lift your finger off, the note will keep ringing. So make sure the piano doesn't get away from you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Starts yeah. doing burnouts down the street, <laughs> does it? Fish tail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that was. Um, so certainly, there's you can you can play stylistically incorrect, or you can play Bach too romantically, or you can play, you know, Rachmaninoff with like not enough dynamic. And is, and is that just considered personal preference, or is there almost People there are almost be, you know, discriminated against because they choose to play it in a certain way. And people go, oh, they're not a very good musician. Certainly that happens. Like there's one pianist um, who exists, this English guy. and I they existed. <laughs> well, his name's James Rhodes. So, and he's, I think he has quite a big performance career. But people certainly kind of like... Criticise him. Yeah, and, like, and I, I, I would belong to that camp oh, as really? well. Why? Yeah, I just find his playing is, I, I think he lacks probably bit of the technique to get the, the sparkle that I expect of like the true masters like Marta Argerich or some other mm. pianists that I love. I've actually, got a, before we move on, I've got a question for you. I've never even thought about this, but is there controversy controversy within running mechanics and how, what is the best running mechanics? Or is it pretty much universal agreement? I think the good thing is this criticism, it's funny because... At the end of the day, whoever runs the fastest gets to do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. But there, it's always interesting because there are people who have different running styles who will be criticised even though they're winning. So like a perfect example is Christian Coleman, who was 2019 world championship, uh, champion in the 100 um, and was clearly beating people pretty consistently. It's questionable now because he did a ban for missing tests. Um but he has a very interesting running style and the way that he does actually run is very different in many technical aspects to other people. So, but there's no, there's no, the criticism was always, oh, he could run faster if he did X, mm. which I don't actually think is always true because I think we have such a limited understanding of some of the more complex features of biomechanics that we don't really have the ability to say those things. Mm. Right? It, 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 the, the outcomes that he gets don't match some of the really basic linear understandings of physics that I think don't necessarily apply always to what we've spoken about, like the myofascial network, understandings of biotensegrity and you know, the complex nature of how we distribute and apply forces across like a very yeah, complex absolutely. anatomical system. Um, so... I think he's actually 
demonstrating things that we don't understand, which is kind of cool because it's actually opening up something that Mm. I think takes the more interested learner to actually go, maybe he's doing something that we need to think about. Um, I'm sure that probably happens in music as well. I was just thinking, so they reckon the greatest, debatably the greatest pianist of the 20th century was Vladimir Horovitz, this Russian guy. And Horovitz's technique, if you, it was very famous because he had very large hands, but he played with such a flat hand, which is, which is against the, the complete the opposite norm. of what most beginning pianists will say, you know, have curvature of the hand, play like so. But you watch his hands yeah, and he played flat. It was very flat. Like it wasn't always flat, but it had a... It was like flatter a, than normal. Totally, very un, unconventional. And so people wouldn't teach in that style. Not so much. And but then you watch other people too, like Marta Argerich, who's a pianist that who I adore, and I think probably has the greatest technique that we've seen. And the mechanics of the way she plays is so open and free that it's. I don't know that she was taught that. Yeah, it's something that she adapted. From yeah, and I think that for hmm. for any, so you start with like mimicry and then pull away from the practice and the top end people like work out how to get the sound they want mm. however they do it and, that, and that doesn't matter how you do it and that's exactly the same you know for you it's if they create a sound mm. that's clearly effective or sounds good yeah. or whatever does it matter how they got there even Igor and Olga who I always kind of we keep talking about so Igor uh, they're a piano duo so they, they train together in Moscow like the, one of the greatest schools in the world Moscow Conservatorium and they did their Bachelor of Music as pianists, and then they did a Masters as um, duo. And you watch Igor play, and he hardly moves. Mm. But the sound that comes out of that instrument is unbelievable, where Olga will really, like, throw her weight. And I don't know that it actually does anything, but for her, but that's... part of the way that she totally. actually creates, yeah. So and you watch someone like Lung Lung, like, who's just an exceptional pianist, but I, I can listen to Lung Lung and just think that was exquisite. But you watch him, and he does all this, like... Over the top affectation, which I hate. Yeah. And but he's very famous for it now as well. Mm. And I think sometimes people probably go to see Lung Lung as well as hear him. Yeah. So you know. All right. Well, let's, let's, go, that, that's let's a, go back to yeah, that's jazz versus classic. The dark, the dark road. Yeah. I better say now you need to define what jazz is. <laughs> so I I have to really think about this. So classical, we say is like notated stuff. Jazz is a style of music that developed in 19th century in America amongst like black slaves. And it started probably like in a kind of folk tradition. So generally when we talk about folk music, we talk about music that belongs to a people that isn't really notated down. So it might be like where your nonno came from in Italy, they would have sung certain songs and all the people in that region know those songs. So jazz started like this. And continued to involve instruments where nothing was notated, but there's very clear structures. And within those structures, we started to have improvisatory elements. So, and that kind of developed and developed. Now, of course, we have a huge canon. And when we say canon in music, we mean like a body of work. It's almost like a library. Totally. So we have this like canon of like jazz standards and Absolutely, you the the melody will be notated. So if we take a song like uh, "Summertime" by George Gershwin, that's totally notated and it's there. But the performances that are probably are famous are ones where you do what's called the head. So you go through the song once as notated, and then the singer will go back and improvise over that structure. And so, uh, is it that it's become a tradition where? There's space left for the improvisation. Absolutely. So, but even jazz, I guess that that journey of like structure and improvisation within structure also exists now in jazz, where you can just go to concerts that are like totally free improvisation, where they don't even know what's going to happen. Um, and there's you've got pianists like Keith Jarrett who rock up and do like an hour improvised play concert. All right, and. How, how do you become a j- jazz musician? Is it you just start picking up the instrument and go, go crazy? <laughs> or do you start out as... A, a, do you need some structure? Yeah, you need to develop yeah. some structure I, first. I think that basically any musician needs to start in the same way. So you still start... Well, I think you could go to a teacher or you could go to some jazz sessions and you just need to learn little 
little cells. But do they normally go through like classical training first, or a, a lot form do, of but some training? like certainly some do. And because jazz musicians, also, like ideally, would like to have note, like be able to read notation as well. But um, you, more than anything, you need to learn the the structure of the songs you're playing. And you need to learn what are the improvisatory like licks or like little solo lines you can play that are going to work. So it's I always think of it as language of like so if I'm talking jazz piano language, what is the repertoire of stuff that I'm able to say in terms of making up my own melody over this song summertime? Do you think you have that skill set though? I think I've got I have I have the understanding of how to do it. So this goes back to my original question. Why do you struggle with it? So I have the understanding how I do it. I have the recordings of the greats in my head. So I can... You're comparing. Well, I can compare Is that improvisation then? Oh, yeah. Well, I can also hear in my head the solo I want to play. I don't have yet the talking between my head and my hand of like, just do that solo that I can hear. Mm. Is that differentiation between the two because you have gone so deep on classical musicianship uh i will it's probably more that i've just not practiced jazz people have this idea that jazz is like free and improvised yeah. mm. it's not so like well yes they are improvising on the night or in the concert but they practice improvisation for hours and hours like there's this we say improvisation what, what do you mean by they practice it what are they doing are they just as they're going they're creating their own so music? there's one school of thought which is where i'm a jazz pianist i'm going to listen to the greats so i'll listen to oscar peterson i'll listen to like loads of other pianists and i will transcribe their solos so i'm going to literally write out exactly how they've played it and do it and in doing that, I'll add to my bag of what's possible. So when I'm soloing, I might take this Oscar Peterson lick and then I'll take this lick from Thelonious Monk and then I'll take something from Ray Charles or whoever it might be. And in creating my own voice. So these jazz guys start, um, like they can be transcribing lots, but then they'll take a song, like a song that I love, Stormy Weather, and it's like play through this song 10 times, but solo differently every time. That would be how you would practice improvising. Do you think that the development of that skill really does require you the space, the space to go and improvise and, and open that up? Like I'm thinking about this, I'll tell you what, I'm thinking about this in terms of say creative participation in sport. And one of the things I think is really interesting is you have players in, say, team sports who are extremely creative, but there's often talk that that gets taught out of them mm -hmm. because initially they make more errors and then they become a bit of a burden, mm. even though they have the ability to create something that may not have been seen sure. before or is often very effective. And the thought that I'm having, and I don't, you know, I say this with a level of ignorance, but for coaches who work in that, are they actually giving improvisation practice time? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but do you think that that's something that you need to do as a musician? You need actually the freedom and that time to do that. Absolutely. I think that you should. I actually think, so what people, a lot of people don't also realise is that classical, improvisation existed in the classical realm as well. But that is an art form that died out around the time of Liszt. So we're talking like, I think 1820s, 30s. So Why did it die out, do you know? I don't, I don't know exactly, but I think it was that maybe composers wanted to have more control over the performance and they wanted it to be like, no, I wrote it this way, it has to be done in this way. So, for instance, so Bach was a phenomenal improviser. So Bach could improvise um, preludes and what's called a fugue. So do you know what, like, if you sing like a round, like row, 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 you both gently down the stream? Okay, don't worry. <laughs> that Bach could improvise these things called fugues, which is like phenomenally difficult to do. Mozart also uh, was an, uh, an improviser. I think Beethoven as well. And with Mozart, you have, like, if you're doing a Mozart piano concerto, so you play all this notated stuff and you get to a point at the end of the first movement where the orchestra stops and you play what's called a cadenza. Nowadays, the art form is coming back where people then improvise, like, a solo for three or four minutes before the orchestra comes back in. 
Now, those cadenzas exist notated out by Mozart, but you can absolutely take thematic materials, so take melodies that we've just heard and then improvise on top of them. Mm. And if you can do that, that's exceptional. So, But that art form is not being taught in classical music degrees anymore. How do you... Well, okay, we've spoken about what it is and how it's a bit different. How do you think that you actually develop that? You just have to do it. And you have to do it... Do you think there's level. other ways of doing it other than just actually practising, as you said, that freedom? Well, probably and listen to lots of versions of stuff as well. Like, you have to go... So musicians learn lots from listening to lots of interpretations of stuff. You have to. Um... Because you've got to listen to the stuff that you think is good and listen to the stuff that you think is not good. And then justify, well, why do you think this is good? Why do you think this is bad? How is it going to then impact your own playing? I'm just thinking, too, in terms of hey, how something like jazz originated from, where they probably didn't have the opportunity to learn uh, in a very structured, formal sense. Mm. They probably just had a set of instruments. I imagine they probably all, they pl- all play multiple instruments, mm. too. And they just get, they pick it up and then start to figure out, oh, this is what the sound makes when I put my finger here yeah. and so on. And they sort of just go from there, which is quite different to the very formal structured process of now. Mm. So, I mean, I, it's always something I think about. And I know in the kind of this new age world where there's lots of perhaps parents will just go, I just want my child to learn in their own time and have complete no structure. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time too, there is clearly a time and a place for that to go like, yeah, you know what? You can have the autonomy to do what you want with this with this practice period. Well, it reminds me of remember that book that you you let me borrow actually called Rest, mm. where it talks about the development of creative pursuits often happens in a very structured manner, mm-hmm. where whether it be a, an author, you know, someone who, um, you know, a journalist, a writer, a scientist, a painter, they will actually set a specific time of the day that they will always sit down to do that work. Mm. It's usually in the morning seems to be the pattern but that's when they will go and they might get a lot done they might get a little bit of done but there is structure to the fact that they're going to practice or ex- like uh, go through some sort the of the intention task. is there yeah. so to speak the most unsuccessful compositional stuff that I have set at Richmond High when I've set assignments the most unsuccessful has been create something that goes for two minutes and that's the only parameters you give hmm. absolutely you need some structure you have to and someone described it to me as like as a river if a river doesn't have banks the water just kind of goes everywhere yeah. mm. but doesn't actually you need banks and you need to channel it in no direction yeah and I think uh, I can't remember where I read it about chess and they're like you know there's so many rules in chess but actually you need those rules to, to have this creativity and I think that that is so applicable to music um, whether it's like knowing the creativity you can have in classical music or knowing what are the what are the parameters you want to improvise in and this this very much links with for the people who know about skill acquisition stuff you know ideas around like constraints based learning mm-hmm. you know you set particular constraints wanting them to actually expose certain skills and you don't really mind how they find their way there but mm. you've set those boundary conditions yeah, yeah. Um, and that, I think that's a really interesting kind of thing as you said with music that you have to set those boundary conditions otherwise you get all sorts yeah. of yeah <laughs> well, and it's probably one of those things too where you can start to create less boundaries the more skilled they potentially become yeah. I think that's the other thing too it also depends on where you are within your mastering of that skill yeah yeah absolutely mm. so like if we look at like just composition I think even at VCE now, like the, the, what is required of students for composing, it's like they don't have to compose a symphony. They have to compose like... Why not? <laughs> well, maybe they should. Um, you know, they're, they're composing stuff that's like three or four minutes, but that's like we're talking at the end of high school. Okay, They've done training. Here's a question there. for you. Go. How is composing different to this jazz improvising improvising because compo- improvising is done in the moment i understand that but what i'm saying is it a similar skill set the ability and are there people who really struggle to compose new music compared with people who can play really well and they can basically mm. mimic but they don't and they can do that at a really high level but they actually don't have the capability or is is it doesn't work like that because th- you're already at such a high level of understanding music that you know what you can put on top I of each other. I think composing and improvising absolutely belong to the same like bank. And I think a lot of composers start through improvisation. They might like improvise a melody and then kind of grow it. Um, and then from that, go back and then continue to edit it and add parts to it and fill it out. I, I think that's always the most interesting thing because I think it's the same with 
any sort of skill acquisition and learning is we start and there's lots of errors, there's lots of mistakes, but it's about just consistently refining that. And I'm just thinking in my own head about my own errors as in terms of coaching of like not allowing people to explore that stuff enough and make their own, uh, you know, error detection and pruning kind of process to bring that back to something. And I, I know that a number of times I've seen um, you know, like even if it's authors talk about how many versions they write of a certain text, and at the start they're like the first version's a load of crap, <laughs> yeah. but the main points are there, and then they refine and their editor will go through it and they'll have twenty versions of it before mm. they're like, okay, this is half decent. Mm. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting thing because we see we see creativity I think as if it's like improvisation where you just make it on the spot and it's brilliant but I don't think that's necessarily how it works it definitely doesn't happen like that if I think back to what you were saying about jazz piano for myself and I'll be doing trying to solo but I'm too critical of myself in the moment of what's coming out but that you think that's a big that's a big thing of like not wanting to feel that level of Self-criticism and for self sure. and, yeah. But also too um, With classical music Because it's like You can't make a mistake Well that's at least The intention you for have sure. When you go to practice You can't hit a clanger Yeah So <laughs> A clanger Yeah That's <laughs> great <laughs> If you're going to hit it Hit it loud Yeah um, Yeah and I remember We did some improvising At Anam as well And I remember Like we had these jazz guys Come in and they're like Just play yeah. Like just Just play something And like no one would get up and do it. I'm like, well, we were amazing players, but... I think you see that in so many industries. Like, I think of our own profession, where if you're someone who went to go present to a group of people, and you're like, look, I've got these ideas I've been putting together, and you go through it, and you th- see that there's actually structure to it, and you've mm. thought it out. But it's really just ideas and theories. They'll just go, well, you know, where's the research to back this up? So, and there's not much opportunity to be quite open in how you think. When in the, my first year at Anam, we had this week-long jazz thing where we had these amazing Melbourne musicians who had Tony Gould and Andrea Keller and a, a couple other amazing, amazing pianists that are here in town. And they got, they kind of had us all there, the students, they're like, we'd love some of you to just get up and improvise something now. And of course, like, we're used to getting up and playing in front of each other. It's like <laughs> Beethoven Sonata or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. People don't want to improvise. No, and the only one who got up was a friend of mine who was a cello player, a guy called Rob, who is, huh. he's a genius of a musician. But he got up and played the piano. And he was at huh. Anam on the cello, but he got down and he's like, I find it so easy to improvise on the piano. And he is a phenomenal pianist. But it had been so long since he's trained classically as a pianist that that's his improvising. Here's, here's a question for you. Is it easier for a jazz musician to pick up classical play or is it the other way around? Oh, I'm not sure. Like, Do you see people who come from more of that jazz upbringing be able to play classical piece as well? Or are they not tight enough in how they play? I think it's probably the other yeah, way. Because I feel like the, the classical technique can go gives you the sound opportunities that you would want to go into the jazz world. Mm. Plus also the theoretical knowledge. So I, I imagine, though, too, those are the people who do a fair bit of classical training and then go, you know what, this isn't for me because they're actually the kind of people who I think are much more yeah, I d- open and spontaneous. Don't, I don't know of any jazz musician who's gone the other way, mm. me personally, mm. but I know of plenty who have gone like this or even like my other friend, Emily, who has gone on to be a, an exceptional folk player and gypsy jazz kind of player. Yeah. I even think of someone like a star me. too. You know, also. Who, I think she just has that ability just to she just bang out anything at any point. Yeah. So and it, like myself as well, like I I went to this Irish folk music thing last week and I was weighing over my head because you go along with an instrument at a pub and they just know the music and they don't even talk they just start playing and it's like you got to know the music or you just got to sit there and it's like I don't know it and they don't use music so you have to listen and like just kind of work it out but I'm like I need to do this because I haven't learnt orally for so long and that's certainly a jazz. A jazz thing as well of like mm. connecting what you hear to being able to play it straight. And, uh, look, you know, and people probably think, what well, you know, why have we gone through this process of talking about this? But I think it's really important, particularly whether it's clinicians um, or you know, or people working in sports performance, to understand that like you need to have. I think it's a really, really clear analogy between learning the foundational qualities and principles and technical skills. But then having the willingness, and we've spoken about a lot, Jack, of these safe-to-fail experiments and being able to explore different areas because knowledge, I think for you and I, we've spoken about this a lot, it's why we even do this podcast, is 
knowledge doesn't grow by just copying what other people do. I think the other big thing too is, it, and I think this is the, the contrast with say classic versus jazz and it's relevant to our profession is the known knowns and the known unknowns. Mm. Because it's all well and good you know, in classical music. You know what the outcome is. You need to be able to play that piece. And we could even think of that with our profession whether you're you know, a clinician or a coach, whatever it is, is you can think about it in theory of like, this is how this person's injury rehabilitation process is going to look. Mm. It's all nice and clear cut. But the reality is when you're confronted with the situation, there are just so many unknowns that come up that you actually have to like, improvise to an extent. There are things that you have to be able to go, well, how do I actually reason through this and how do I make sense of actually what's going on? On that, do you think that that's something that we need to consider of creating enough opportunities, particularly for students? Because I think what Tom was talking about where students didn't want to get up and play mm. for these jazz musicians. I think we see that so much with students when you're like, all right, we'll just try something. Oh, I don't know what to do. Oh. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think we need to actually in our profession, particularly is create opportunities for them to explore things in a very, almost a creative manner and give them improvisation time. Well, the biggest criticism I have is you always hear people talking about clinical reasoning, clinical mm. reasoning. Yeah, how, how do you develop it? And this is the thing. It's like, well, if you have a practical exam on a muscular thing and you have an expectation that this student better do A, B, and C, because if they don't, they've done Fail, it wrong yeah. compared to what I expect them to do, that's not clinical reasoning. That's just protocol and regurgitation. Mm. And so if you expect people to be able to problem solve in situations when there are unknown circumstances or variables involved, well, there's not an opportunity you know to figure out what to do. what this reminds me of too is... It's like when we spoke to Paul Coburn and he said people will do things and get great outcomes when they're working with, say, TAC patients. Yeah. And they're not following the guidelines mm. in the stricter sense. Like, they're obviously following things that make, you know, clinical their clinical reasoning make sense. But when they do it, it doesn't really fit what the guidebook says or the protocol says but they get exceptional outcomes. And I think we, as you said, we need to understand that more. And I think you're, you're giving a really good example of creating opportunities for people to practice their clinical reasoning in an environment that allows for exploration rather than just this is right or this is wrong. Well, I think it's a good question for you, John, is what's the uh, guidelines for getting someone to run under 10 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> You talk about having the space to improvise in your work. Mm. Um, when I think of that back to jazz, what I should also clarify is there's improvising and improvising. So, like, if I just sit down and play any random notes, yeah, that's improvising. But in terms of actual jazz, those improvisations are highly structured and adhere to very strict yeah, they're not, they're rules. Not, they're it's not just random crap. Yeah. And it's not like, and it's probably a good point to make if someone comes in with a hamstring strain and you go, you actually don't know anything about, you know, the anatomy or biomechanics, but I want you to work with this person who strained yeah, their hamstring. You know, or you, you start going completely off, off you know, are oh, we going to do upper body training? For totally. Them? Like, it's not related. No, and These no. notes don't make any sense, yeah, as yeah. you said. Alrighty. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to ask your brother that you want to actually have recorded for, for the history of time? I have to say, um, you actually know more than I thought you did. I'm glad. <laughs> this is all I know and nothing else. <laughs> all right. Thomas Williams, thank you very much. We thank really you appreciate, you, appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Very welcome.